Chapter 2 Regrets ached more than worn innards and aged bone, worse than those old breaks on the tundra and tiger grate. After decades alone in the grey, on the hunt, joy deferred, dreams forsaken, all for a greater good, at a better place, in another life. It made sense once. That had long waned by that year of our Lord, 1974. Those spasms of doubt were cut short by a gnashing cough, which yanked him back into the moment and task at hand, just breathing. He keeled over in the snow, gagging, frothing red onto the powdery, wintry canvas. His body seized till the fray let up. Nights were worse. Ivers staggered back to his feet, small spade in hand. He resumed digging. With every thrust into the icy muck, his gashed face winced and his mauled hands purpled. The long, rugged, brown coat on him dangled in shreds, intact only because of its metallic inner lining. Strewn about were the tattered remnants of other armoured coats among the rhubarb bodies lying around, torn apart. Rocks coddled fresh graves. They were in a better place. Ivers feebly hid the burials beneath brush as best he could, wheezing and faltering until he collapsed against a nearby tree. He stared blankly into the nothingness, trembling, trying to catch his breath, clutching himself beneath the arms to warm his marred hands. Where did he go wrong? When? How did it all get there? The years had long become wailing ghosts, Gone, yet mourning what could have been. A life with Isabella. A something special that would have been cosy, hot, sacred and messy. It would have worked. That became clear in retrospect. It had been a chance at a real life, a lifetime ago. If only he had sought love as fervently as his obsession with silencing macabre howls that tore through remote Siberian nights like butchering winds, spattering bloodied gobs and shards of prey. Alaska had not been kinder. It echoed that greatest regret. Ivers hobbled to a mound in the snow, fell to his knees and dug out his gear with the spade. The flurries had laid siege to it overnight. He strapped the spade to his rucksack and gingerly flung it onto his back by the shoulder straps, wincing in agony. Ivers then grabbed his rifle and writhed to his feet and stumbled away. Jutting over his shoulder like a bloodied scorpion talon from the sheath affixed to the back of his coat was a sword handle. Whatever it was, Ivers had survived. He had given as good as he got. Dusk loomed as he meandered the remote wild, coughing violently. He lumbered past frostbitten boulders and trees, arriving eventually at a frozen river. He barely crawled across the thin, crackling ice on his stomach as it was breaking apart and beginning to drift away. Ivers made it onto terra firma before fully sinking, soaked and shivering violently. He fixed his sights upstream, at something awaiting him in the distance, also on the riverbank. It was a small river cabin on stilts. He stumbled along, inching closer and closer, stalked by the approaching night. A gallows crossbeam gradually became discernible beside the cabin. Busted chains dangled eerily from it, jingling in the breeze like some boding merriment. Beneath the gallows was a deep, underlying pit. Ivers lurched for the cabin door, wheezing and shivering uncontrollably. He careened in, slammed the door shut and dropped his gear as he fell to his knees. He struggled to light the logs in the wood stove. Lackadaisical flames bubbled feebly. Ivers laboured to swallow pills between coughing fits. He opened a jar, scooped his fingers in and lathered the pungent, 
menthol rub all over his chest and throat. He hunkered the pneumonia's onslaught in a sleeping bag on the cold floor. Amid fevered sweats and racking chills, billowy memories of Isabella's sensuous hands soothed him. She could caress away any misery. Illness had nothing on the torment of having chosen the wrong life. Over her, decades ago, on faith alone. She had long become an angel of doubt, warning against a life unlived, in pursuit of fallacy. He couldn't die like this without making things right. That had been his ulterior motive, this final mission. But the engine of redemption was running on empty, and the fumes of dogma had long run out. A lesser man would have succumbed sooner. The burdens of consciousness lifted for a precious few days. The wisdom of the flesh is death. Ivor slowly awoke. But the wisdom of the spirit is life and peace, Baudry preached. Two foreboding figures stood over Ivor's, blocking the light radiating from the open door. It was Day and his last two remaining men, not the other side beckoning. We know where it escaped, brother, McConnelly reported. A coastal mountain range. Ivers sat up and rubbed his eyes. The illness was subsiding. He'd been given another chance at redemption. Where are... Dead. Ivers rasped numbly, offering no explanation for his other men's demise. None was needed. The restrained fury in Baudry's and McConnelly's eyes made it clear they understood. The others had been killed in action. We will persevere till we are as well. Or till this is finished, Ivers ordered. Baudry and McConnelly glanced subtly at one another. You're deathly ill, brother, McConnelly tried to reason. Track it, find it, split up to cover more ground. Only the most elite members of the Order survived a mission. Those who survived multiple missions were allowed to hunt alone as Ivers had before age had confined him to again lead a team. Given the circumstance, they'd have to go on without him. So Ivers waved them off, frailly. He had never been more accepting of his imminent retirement from the Order altogether, even after decades alone in the grey. I won't be far, Ivers assured them, unwilling to slow them down. It was an age-old black operation. We are here to save souls. That is the mission. 